Hey everybody, it's Lot and Sib, and it's time once again for your weekly wrap up. And this week we're coming back to the topic of Starlink. There's some updates on their beta and where you can use it from. And there's some competition on the horizon because Amazon was approved to launch satellites for a similar service. Lots to talk about now, so let's get to it. So let's begin with the Starlink beta information. And I think some of you might be a little disappointed as to where this will be available initially. As usual, the Starlink subreddit has proven to be a tremendous resource. And some really resourceful people on that subreddit noticed that Starlink had updated their website and there was a bunch of embedded JavaScript code that wasn't yet live but visible. And they were able to pull out a lot of data from that code. It could change as things go live here, but it appears as though this is lining up with what we're seeing in orbit. So the first thing is that the beta is going to be limited to the northern U.S. and southern Canada. We knew that already. Uh, but now we've got a little bit more specifics as to exactly how north or how south uh, you need to be in one of those two countries. Um, so it looks as though they're going to limit things to the Washington state area initially, and they're focusing primarily on rural or remote communities there. So if you are in that area, sign up for the beta if you haven't already, because there's probably a good chance you'll get into it. Uh, additionally, they said that in the early outset, uh, it's going to be available in a very specific range across the continent, uh, 44 to 52 degrees north latitude. So if you're outside of that area, you're not going to be able to make use of the service initially. And it also looks as though if you are in that area, you need a good view of the northern sky in order to pick up the satellites. There's a great website on GitHub that's been tracking the orbits of the satellites and what we could expect for coverage given those orbits. And their work here really lines up with what Starlink is talking about. You can see that big dark blue band there is right now the most reliable coverage of the Starlink constellation. The lighter blue areas have coverage, but not enough to get you through the whole day. So if we zoom into a section of Washington State that's in that dark blue area, uh, you can see here that you'll get coverage for about 97% of the day. Not the whole day, but most of it. And that, of course, will improve as more satellites get up into space and on orbit and in their positions. Uh, where I am, just outside of New York City, uh, right now we're only at about 82.4%. So it's going to take a little while longer for uh, the rest of the uh, continent here to get more reliable service. And of course, that is going to take a while and a lot of launches. Remember, they're only sending up 60 satellites at a time. Uh, there's several hundred up there right now. And as you can see, several hundred is not enough to cover the globe or even North America. Because remember, these are low Earth orbit satellites that are constantly in motion. Another detail from the uh, Starlink subreddit on the FAQ is that if you do get into the beta, you can't talk to anybody about it. So we're not going to get a lot of details here as to what the experience is like. Because once you're in, you're signing an NDA. And I would imagine if you leak anything out, your uh, beta privileges are out. So we're not going to hear a lot unless maybe somebody comes on the subreddit every once in a while and lets us know what the experience is like. Although I would venture to say that at least in the early get-go here, it's going to be very buggy as they start rolling things out. It probably won't represent what the service will be at all but it's exciting to see that there is some operational stuff beginning here. And it appears as though there's a lot of consumer demand for the service even before it launches. SpaceX thought they would initially need a million customer antennas. Now they've applied to the FCC for an additional four million. Uh, they need authorization for the actual number of transmitters that they'll be installing across the country. And they said that they are applying for this because in just the first couple of days of that signup form being available, uh, just about 700,000 individuals across the United States signed up for it. And that doesn't include people from other parts of the world or Canada either. So this is something that clearly has a lot of demand. I've been seeing a lot of views on videos when I talk about this topic. People need this because we have been suffering for a long time with either monopolies that are not improving their network or no network service at all that's uh, competitive with other parts of the country. So this is going to be, I think, something that will be a real revolutionary product once they get everything in orbit and operating. Uh, SpaceX was also granted the authority to operate ground stations. This is kind of a hint as to when we can expect the, the service to continue rolling out. Uh, they're going to be installing stations in California, Minnesota, Idaho, Alabama, Georgia, and Montana. And the way this is going to work initially is that 
when you go out on the internet, you're going to send your request to the satellite. The satellite will ping the ground station and the data will be sent up from the ground station to the satellite and back to you. I thought the way this was going to work was that the satellites were going to communicate with each other. It looks as though that'll probably happen down the road, but initially it's going to operate more like a traditional satellite service where you're pinging to the ground station through the satellite in orbit. This will definitely increase latency, so we'll have to see if they can meet the FCC's challenge for that low latency connection. And it looks as though they're getting these things put in temporarily, perhaps to bridge the gap until they have a better on-orbit network. So we'll keep an eye on that, but that's another development that came up this week. Now, in another bit of news, Morgan Stanley held their big space forum this week for investors. Now, it should be noted, of course, that SpaceX is a privately held company. You can't go buy stock in them just yet, but there was some speculation that they might spin Starlink off as its own business unit that could be publicly traded. The company denied that they were doing that, but the rumors were out there. And those rumors will no doubt persist because at this forum, the bull case that was being made by Morgan Stanley was for the launch revenue versus the Starlink service. Uh, SpaceX is poised, if they can get their new rocket developed successfully, to bring the cost of launch down from 50 to 60 million, which I believe is already at a all-time low, to five to seven million dollars, which will make them probably the only uh, launch provider that can get things into orbit at a reasonable price. I'm sure they'll get competition eventually, but they are so far ahead of their competitors that I think this is something that is possible. And it looks as though Morgan Stanley believes that to be the case as well. And that might uh, encourage the company to spin Starlink off as its own operating unit so they can focus primarily on the launch services component. We'll have to see what happens there. Now this, by the way, is the SpaceX Starship rocket, which is what all those investors are excited about. It's a vehicle capable, at least by its design, of lifting very heavy loads to orbit or beyond to the uh, moon or Mars. But the rocket is completely reusable. Everything can come back and be serviced and sent back up again. And that is what investors think will bring the launch cost down that substantially. And when you look at something that's fully reusable and can lift a lot of stuff at the same time, that's what brings the cost down. And that's what everyone's really eager to see developed here. And this could also be good for Starlink because they can launch many more Starlinks per rocket versus what they can now on the Falcon 9, which can only do about 60 at a shot. And there's also some urgency here for SpaceX to develop the rocket because NASA is working on developing their own deep space rocket right now, but it's completely disposable. Everything you see on that launch pad, with the exception of the capsule at the top, gets thrown out after every launch. And if SpaceX can develop the capacity to provide a similar lifting capacity for far less with a reusable rocket, you can imagine that this is not only going to be big for commercial space access, but government access too, like they've proven with their crude Dragon capsule that just splashed down over the weekend. Now we also have some news this week about a potential Starlink competitor, Amazon and their Kuiper project. Now, as many of you know, Amazon is owned by Jeff Bezos, who also has his own private space program called Blue Origin. They've been kind of operating, not in stealth mode, but not as publicly as SpaceX has been operating, but they've been making a lot of progress on their rockets. And Amazon is hoping to utilize that launch capacity in the future to start up their own broadband network orbiting the planet. And this week they got FCC approval to do just that. Uh, the FCC on a bipartisan five to zero vote, an unusual thing these days, uh, granted a license to launch 3,236 satellites. I should say it's an authorization, not a license. Uh, but nonetheless, they are authorized now when they're ready to start sending satellites up for this new service. And it looks as though they're going to take a slightly different approach, at least initially. So Starlink, of course, is going direct to consumer. It looks like Amazon's going to focus a bit on the competitors to Starlink that are on the ground namely the lousy LTE and 5G services that are available uh, to customers in rural areas. Now, I heard from a lot of you who have just terrible speeds, like less than a megabit sometimes off your wireless provider. But what Amazon wants to do here with Kuiper is work as a backhaul to bring in much faster data speeds to those towers without having to run expensive fiber out to them. And in many ways, this kind of runs parallel to the Amazon web services business where for example, Amazon doesn't own or run Zoom, 
but Zoom runs its application on Amazon servers. In fact, that was a big part of Amazon's web services growth over the last quarter was Zoom calls because Zoom uses Amazon for infrastructure. And this would really fit in quite well with Amazon's existing strategies for providing that kind of back back-end infrastructure, and in this case, it would be a backhaul infrastructure. So I don't know if we'll see a lot of customers signing up directly for this service, but it might make existing infrastructure that's on the ground more competitive to Starlink. And this is great for rural broadband because you'll go from having no choices to having at least more than one. So that's great, and hopefully uh, Amazon is able to continue development here and offer a competitive service. But they've got a long way to go because they don't have a rocket, they don't have a satellite, and they don't have ground stations yet. And this is stuff that Starlink all has already. So we'll have to just keep an eye on this and see where things go. It looks as though the uh, rocket that uh, Blue Origin has been developing to launch this and other things will start testing next year. So this is farther out, I think, than where Starlink is at the moment. But I think once they get that launch capacity going and that rocket proves itself as something that's reliable and reusable, you'll see, I think, an acceleration in competitiveness here. So it looks as though uh, SpaceX and Amazon and everyone else is in a great space race here and it's going to be great for humanity and great for customers at the same time. So we'll keep an eye on this and I'll be updating all of you as new developments come out on these new technologies. Now this week's wrap up is being brought to you by all of you. We had one super chat contributor during one of our live streams this week. That was Acer Corporation. Thank you very much for your super chat. We also have new supporters this week that signed up on my donor box page. They include Martin Waring and Liko Puha. So I want to thank both of them for their contributions to the channel and to everyone who's been contributing on an ongoing basis and all of you who watch on a regular basis too because all of those things equal channel growth. And if you want to support the channel, you can. You can go to lon.tv support and find that donor box page. We also support the YouTube membership program where you can click that join button right below this video and sign up to be a member here on the channel. The YouTube thing will give you some cool little badges that will appear next to your name in comments and in chats. And again, I wanna thank everyone for your continued support. Uh, we did one live stream last week, although I've got a few on the docket coming up this week. Uh, we were playing around with a Kodak mobile film scanner. It was kind of a fun little doodad to mess around with. I got a lot of traffic on that one primarily because I was going through some old photos, some old photo negatives that I had. So it was kind of fun to see some of that. We found a few pictures of my old technology that I was using at the time those pictures were taken as well. And you can find that link linked down below in the master playlist. Uh, we had nothing on the extras channel this week, but I do have a bunch of stuff coming in today that we'll be unboxing soon for that channel. And then on the main channel, we took a look at a Logitech combo keyboard and touchpad for the iPad 10th 10.2, the seventh generation iPad. Uh, we also looked at the HP Pavilion X360 14, the 2020 version, a nice little laptop. And we played around with the Mi Stick, which is an Android TV stick that should sell for around 30 bucks or so uh, when it reaches the shores. And you can find it for around that price on AliExpress and a few other uh, websites as well. And I got some complaints about the fact that I seem to like the Mi Stick better than the TiVo that I reviewed a few weeks ago. And it all comes down to marketing. The TiVo was being billed as a 4K streaming box that's as, just as good as all the other ones out there. And it wasn't, at least at the time I reviewed it. It didn't live up to the marketing. The Mi Stick is a 1080p cheap streaming device running Android TV that costs 30 bucks or thereabouts. And I think for that price, for what the expectations were that they set, it's not a bad thing if you're looking for an Android TV for a secondary television. And that's why I like that one better than the TiVo. And again, I always look at the marketing and if it's living up to the marketing and it's living up to what they're telling consumers, then it gets a good review. But if it doesn't, we need to point out those things. And that was why I like the Mi Stick better, even though it's not a great performer. It's not designed to be and they weren't selling it as such. And that is why I had the opinion I did on it. Now this week on the channel, we've got a bunch of stuff to look at. I got in the outdoor wise camera the other day. In fact, I've been using it uh, already and it seems to be doing pretty well. I've got a tropical storm on the way here to Connecticut where I live. So we'll see how it does in that, but so far so good. A nice alternative to the blink cameras if you've ever played with those. And we'll give a closer look at that uh, on the main channel. Uh, we're going to take a look at this keyboard that I promised you would be looking at last week. It just got knocked off the schedule. 
I already reviewed it. It's ready to go. You can go to Amazon and check it out there if you want to watch the review ahead of time. And then I also hope to get to the Dell XPS 15 that came in the other day. A really attractive laptop with a built-in GPU. So that's another one I'm excited to check out. And I'm getting some other stuff in too, including two Lenovo ThinkPads. Uh, one is running with an Intel processor, and then there's an identical run running with an AMD processor. And we'll take a look and see which one performs better. And I'd love to get some feedback as to what you'd like me to test for that one. Now, if you want to get notified every time we do something here on the channel, you can click the bell and that will get a notification pushed out via email and to your mobile devices, however you set up your notification alerts. We also have other channels that you can find me on here, including my Amazon shop, where we are doing live streams all the time, so you can find me there. And we've got some other ways to engage with the channel, including my infrequent email list at lon.tv slash email. Uh, the best thing you can do is sign up for the Facebook group. We're well over a thousand people now, and I'm finding the Facebook group has been really good for people who are having tech support issues with some of the topics that we cover frequently here on the channel. Uh, Mocha is a good one, for example. I've been getting a ton of people writing in with tech support questions via email to me directly, and I feel guilty because I don't often have time to get to all of them, and I would love to help out as many people as possible. So if you go to the Facebook group, I can help out a little bit, but also other viewers who uh, sometimes know a lot more about stuff than I do can also uh, jump in and help solve your problem quicker. So please head over there. It's a great resource. I found it to be a great source of topics for this show, but also again to help out viewers. And it's a great way to connect everybody. And I would love for YouTube to develop some kind of group functionality so that we could do it right here on the platform. So hopefully that happens at some point. But until then, the Facebook group is the next best thing. And then we've got my store where I sell previously used items that we reviewed here on the channel. There's one of everything. That's it, but you can often get new stuff for less than what it costs new. And if you want to sign up to be notified when those things happen, you can go to lon.tv slash store alert, and we will let you know whenever things get updated in the store via email, and you can jump in and buy it. And that is going to do it for this week's weekly wrap-up. I want to thank you all again for your continued support and viewership and your comments and suggestions. I greatly appreciate it. We'll be back with another wrap-up next week on some other topic. And we will also, of course, have a lot of cool tech reviews happening throughout the week, along with a couple of live streams peppered in as well. Set those notifications, and that'll do it for now. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching. This channel is brought to you by the Lon.TV supporters, including Gold Level supporters Tom Albrecht, Chris Allegretta, David Hockman, Brian Parker, Mike Patterson, and Bill Pomerantz. If you want to help the channel, you can by contributing as little as a dollar a month. Head over to lon.tv slash support to learn more. And don't forget to subscribe. Visit lon.tv slash s.